Well, hello again. Uh, now I'd like to go over the area, the subject matter of image formation. We're going to look at an overview. We're going to look at polar to Cartesian transformation. The reason for that will become apparent. Then look at autofocusing, target motion compensation, and shadowing that will occur in uh, synthetic aperture radar images when objects are high and you can measure the height of the object by looking at the shadows that, that are present. And now let's start with by generally looking and we're going to use the the MIT limit SAR as an example to start off but just use it to look at the general flow of SAR processing. Here we have the aircraft flying above the ground with the SAR radar in the nose and here we see it illuminating the data at the ground and data from GPS and IMUs are recorded and also the pulse return data is recorded. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention earlier which is important mentioning is I showed you that large uh, RAID that's three and a half terabytes. Uh, that's enough RAID recording uh, space to hold uh, the, the data for a half of a day of continuous data collection, whole half of a day. So that's, it's, it's quite impressive that you can collect that much data, store it on the plane, and then take it down. So after we take that net navigation data from GPS and IMUs and the radar pulse data, it will go into the pulse processing and then image formation, and then pixel processing, where we'll come out with an image. And here is an image of a, uh, a runway uh, taken using the, uh, the limit SAR. Now I'm going to look at the pulse processing example using the limit radar. Um, we have a 50 microsecond transmit pulse here and uh, it's going to collect data over a record window that's 76 microseconds wide and the PRF is 2 kilohertz and that means that we're going to have 36,800 samples per pulse and I remember we had I believe it's eight channels so all that data yes it, all that raw data is going to be collected and it's going to go into a matched filter for the data. It's an FM radar. It's going to go into an FFT. And then the navigation data phase delays will be compensated. And then there'll be um, uh, the matched filter data and channel equalization. To, uh, will all go in and be, uh, beams will be formed. Uh, this particular radar uh, uses uh, has a set of uh, beams that are formed to create the actual uh, antenna beam and uh, those uh, those channels have to be combined with all that data and what we come out with is the frequency domain pulses focused at the aim point and here is the transmit pulse as a function of time you can see it's 50 microseconds wide and it's a, uh, a downward FM chirp that's the transmit pulse. And this points out just the, uh, the, the errors. We'll look at a little later in more detail between the ideal path and the actual path of, the, of an aircraft. We're going to have a range error there that has to be compensated for. So the things we're going to focus, uh, focus on, no pun intended, are focusing only on the center point of the beam. That's what we want to do, and we're going to look at what we have to do to compensate so that everything is in phase with that center point of the beam, so that we'll have the entire beam all focused. It's going to have to apply phase corrections, things like that. To uh, There's going to be a range migration of the target's phase during data collection, and we'll go over in detail in a minute or two how to show you how that happens. We're going to have transform the data from the polar format, which it's collected, where we sweep across an angle to a Cartesian format that will be very efficient for digital processing through Fourier transforms. 
where you want linear phase between the samples. And so then we'll end up with exact focusing of the target data. So let's look at the uh, range walk pro uh, problem, how things will defocus. We have a target, uh, and as we move along, it's going to walk through the beam. The target's located here, this point. And it'll go through many bins during the data collection as the aircraft moves. And this shows as a function of time the range from the aircraft. And this will be how the phase changes as the range changes. Uh, when a, if a target is initially when it's perpendicular at P1. Now if we have a time shift, we have another uh, target uh, P2 that's at the same range, but we see it later on, it's over here, we'll have a different curve of range from the radar, i.e. the phase. And when we have a, 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 a target out at a further range, it'll have indeed a third, there'll be a curvature change for P3, a target out here, which is at a different range. And so there'll be a different curve to this parabola. And what we want to do is we want to focus all this. And there are a number of solutions that, of course, are increasing computational complexity. For low resolution, we can just center on the focus, the, the center point only, and do an FFT on the data. And uh, there's been developed the method of uh, polar formatting of the data before we do the FFT, which is very efficient. It's somewhat area limited, uh, but it gives just excellent results, and it's very good for high resolution. We're going to look into that polar formatting technique. And uh, there are other uh, range migration techniques, uh, so-called omega-k, which will work uh, over wide areas. They're good for strip math, linear flight path. This is good for spotlight. This is good for both. And, uh, and then you, what you can do is for each point that comes back, you can develop the match filter for that point. And there's, you'll get exact focusing, but it's extremely complex. Just imagine the, the, the hundreds of thousands of points that one would want to develop an, an optimum match filter for. And so it's in this area that people tend to operate the radars, the algorithms, to trade off the complexity. So now let's look. We have frequency domain pulses focused at the aim point. We're going to be doing polar resampling, and we'll go into detail in a minute what that is. We're going to do autofocusing, which is an extra um, focusing of the data that the, um, the corrections for the uh, GPS and the IMUs, they're only so good that we'll automatically take out the last little bit to give us an even better focused uh, image. And then we're going to send it into a two-dimensional uh, inverse Fourier transform where we'll get out the focused image. And the farm moves by that fixed target uh, direction of the radar's K, uh, K, K wave number. It changes. The K changes. And when the digital processing techniques to use in SAR, it's very important that they be uniformly spaced in case in Ace of the electric field samples. We want them uniformly spaced in K space so we'll have uniform phase. And uh, let's take a look at the far field spotlight phase response. And see, here's a spotlight, and we'll center on the 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 uh, point we're going to pick as the origin is the center of the spot that we're spotlighting on. And here's the SARI antenna. It moves up, and it's a distance. If this is 0, 0, the center of the antenna is at minus R0. And as the aircraft would move up, 
this point up here would be at minus r tan r tan theta and so we can calculate at a given point in the spot we want to focus on at xy uh, what the phase is and just by take doing the geometry here and we come out with this factor right here which is the distance over to this point and it is just given by this equation exactly here. Now if we do a Taylor series expansion uh, of this uh, square root which and it's good for when r is much greater than uh, y squared, 4y squared over lambda and that's valid for this case we come out with this expression and when we subtract the phase at an arbitrary point in the spot with the center phase we get this expression okay we have theta is the just the angle between the where the data is taken at a later time and the center point here okay now here we have that same data only we've uh, that same coordinate system we, and here we have the received samples uh, they fit a polar grid and the desired samples we want we want them to fit a rectangular grid here's the phase center and it's you know if you've done a bunch of math if you're at the point where you've what should I say uh, take this course you can see that if we let uh, if we transform this data from uh, the theta space and we let u, uh, ux equal the frequency times cosine theta and uy equal f sine theta we can transform the data to points that are on this rectangular grid and the centered phase is at that point so the point response will have a linear phase in ux uy space as it enters the FFT now here's the raw data in frequency uh, theta space in that polar format and what we tend to do is to take it in a two-step process we do a Fourier transform along each pulse and then we do it in cross range and you see we get a very nice rectangular grid now I'm going to step back for a moment to the block diagram so here we have the polar resampling done that data will go into the autofocus algorithm and all of that will feed into the two-dimensional inverse Fourier transform which will give us a focused image now with regard to motion compensation uh, synthetic aperture radars need very very good knowledge of the true position of the SAR at the time of transmission and airborne platforms use GPS and IMU systems to derive their range errors and satellites employ orbital models and radar altimeters and things uh, but you, the, you want to do some auto focusing and uh, that takes the, the final residual out so that you're down to the kind of really tiny errors that you need in order to truly focus this radar beam in cross range superbly uh, our goal obviously being that the range error range resolution is the same as the cross range resolution so it needs to be reduced the range error uh, needs to be reduced to a fraction of a wavelength the range that we measure the position of the platform and for X band that's less than a millimeter and three centimeter you want it's really low okay now here's one auto focusing technique uh, that many people use it was developed by this fellow uh, there's a number of different algorithms that have been auto focus techniques that have been developed and these photographs show a uh, an array of solar reflectors in New Mexico there you can see that there it's it's somewhat blurry and the automatic algorithm is used to remove the motion induced phase centers and you can see that this really sharpened up the the, the uh, image of the array of solar reflectors now there are a lot of other 
a, a fair number of other ones, other autofocus techniques, than they're described in reference one. Now let's look in more detail at the moving target displacement in a SAR. I mentioned it very early in passing, uh, almost at when the, in the introduction when I showed you that picture, Buena Vista. Anyway, here's the uh, limit radar, and we notice we have a moving target at this range, and it's the same range as a stationary target, but it's moving. And then when the aircraft moves, you can it still ca can move into the same range gate as a safe stationary target. So the vehicle and the stationary target are at the same range at the start of data collection and the vehicle and the stationary target at the, are at the same range at the end and throughout range uh, data collection. So the SAR cannot distinguish the moving vehicle from the stationary vehicle with the systems of processing that I've described before and as we overlap now that section of that intersection we see that um, the cross range can't be taught, um, uh, is blurred for targets that are in the uh, are, that are slowing down as they move to get into the left hand turn lane that's why we see that blur so I wanted to go over this so you can understand physically exactly what was happening but algorithms have been developed again here's a example from Sandia where their twin otter at 15 gigahertz has a resolution of 3 meters and here's some uh, uncompensated data in range and when they apply a motion compensation algorithm to it you can take right out the motion compensation of the data and see crisp clear images really neat now lastly to the shadowing of ground objects and this is also from uh, this is courtesy of General Dynamics and uh, here's the Washington Monument and the radar is up here at the top and the radar beam of course can't see behind the image so it's black behind here but it's behind the uh, Washington Monument it's shadowed and we could measure the height of the object by knowing the length of the shadow, the height of the SAR, and the ground range. And they're all measurable quantities. And so we can derive from that the height of the target right here. And this is all for a flat earth. And you can see here shadows of trees and of trees and of course a hedge next to the ground wouldn't have much of a shadow a very tall tree would have a high shadow and of course the Washington Monument has quite a shadow so that's a very interesting how we can derive the height of a target from its shadow with synthetic aperture radar data and now uh, the next section uh, we'll, we'll, is going to focus, we'll focus in a minute in, in the next part, on advanced image formation techniques. And there are a wealth of them, and we're just going to look at three different advanced image formation techniques, but there are many others. So this is the end of the, the image formation section.